surgery in computers. And in a funny way, the reason I say that is one of the one of the liberating things about not having any qualifications is you're quite happy to take a chance because you're not throwing anything away to start a business. So, and it's it's quite interesting that when I meet, I, it, it's changed a lot um, recently. But when I meet meet people more of, of my age, it's amazing how many people have started businesses don't have a university degree and they and they started a business because. That basically that's that, that's all they had to that's all they could do and if it hadn't have worked it didn't really matter because you just had to get a job based on your wits anyway so um, so the whole thing was a kind of accident really so I started selling um, computers I got a job with a, a very big Japanese electronics firm selling their computers and then one day someone came and said, uh, we're not selling so many computers, but we're selling a lot of mobile phones. You're being moved into selling mobile phones. So I, I didn't know anything about mobile phones either. So I just went up one floor and, and sat at the same, same desk, same sort of desk, looking at the, the same window, um, and, and started to try, and, uh, to try and sell mobile phones. But that was obviously, that was an incredibly lucky break because, um, you know, Although they were, I mean, they, they really were car phones, they were bricks, but, but they were transforming people's lives, and suddenly it's what, it's absolutely what everybody wanted. So having done that with them for uh, three years, I, I, I don't know why, I decided that I, should, that I should try and start selling them directly to customers myself, because when I, the company I worked for, NEC, we used to sell them to, to BT and Vodafone and people, we didn't sell them directly to customers um, themselves. And I guess the one, I had one, one insight, which was that the, the people that, the people I sold them to, they were, you know, who were reselling them, they, they were trying to, always trying to sell them to like really big companies. Uh, and they thought they were the people that were going to buy mobile phones. But what I could see is that the mobile phone actually transformed the life of the self-employed and small business people. Because you imagine before that, if you were a builder or a photographer or whatever you might be, you couldn't get your next job whilst you were at work. You had to wait till you got home, listen to your answer machine, call the people back. So if you didn't have a big infrastructure to support you, the mobile phone transformed your life. So I just I set up this business to 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 blog phones, and my idea was it should be about selling to to individual users rather than to rather than to big companies. Um, it started in a. Is this going on? Okay. It started. In a, yeah. Can you hear me if I just yes, talk? Yes. Um, so it started in a in a in a flat um, on the Marylebone Road, which was, which I. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> which I, um, I had a friend of mine who was a music publisher and he had, he, he had this, this flat and he used part of it and, and we used part of it. And the reason it was called Carphone Warehouse is we were so self-conscious of the fact that we were tiny, that we were tiny um, working out of a flat in London and not, you know, why would you want to buy from us? That we just tried to come up with a name that just sounded really big. <laughs> and if you called it warehouse, it was like cheap because it was like direct to the public. Um, our warehouse was the airing cupboard in the, the <laughs> flat. But and in those days, most of what we sold was we'd come. It was a car phone. We would come. I mean, I try to explain that to people today. Just can't comprehend it. You had you have a phone. It was nailed in your car. You could only ever use it when you were in your car, it wouldn't come out. And that's because the networks were so poorly, were so immature and so poorly built out that the, the signal on the portable phone just wasn't strong enough. You just, wouldn't, you just couldn't reach the next station. You probably could in London, but most places you couldn't. So we would just, we, we, would, we would send guys out who, who would go and, and uh, fit these phones at people's offices or homes or wherever and we, and we, uh, and we operated out of this flat. And it was, you know, to be honest, it was just being in the right place at the right time. If, if there was, if there was anything, anything we brought to it, it was that we were 
so young and, and naive that we just went with it and we just grew we just grew this business and signed leases on shops and did stuff. I don't think really without ever considering the obligations that we were taking on or the scale of the thing that, that, that was build, building up. It was just we just rode the, the bow wave of this thing and one of the things I think I've learned is if you can find if you can be in a growing market, it's so unbelievably forgiving. To try and to try and squeeze out life in a diminishing market is an absolute nightmare. But to fight for market share even in, in a mature market is very hard work. But in, instead of being into something that's growing very fast, and that's, uh, the things that are growing fast now tend to be more about disruption necessarily than something completely new that people haven't had before. But that's fine. But you need. I think one of the things I'd say to everyone who was who kind of was was in was being an entrepreneur or, or thinking about wanting to be an entrepreneur, growth is the most forgiving thing possible. And we made the most terrible, terrible mistakes and did really stupid things. But in the end, the, the growth always maintained it. And the people, you know, we were selling so many phones and we were signing up phones for Vodafone and Cellnet, which is what O2 was called in those days that they, they would forgive us if we did something a bit wrong or we were late with this or we, or we weren't organized in a way that it just, it, it just wouldn't, I can't see it possibly um, happening anymore. So we, you know, this thing grew and grew. As I say, we made loads of mistakes. We, we expanded overseas too far. We had to retrench um, in, in a number of markets. We took the company uh, public in 2000. That's a very mixed thing. I don't think I don't think we could have got away with growing it and keeping it going as a private company. But being a public company is a pretty miserable thing. So and, and it's very is time consuming and cumbersome. So if you can avoid ever ever going public. <laughs> Do. I know it feels like this is the great, which is amazing that we thought that. We ring the bell, we get the money, it's fantastic, and then but then you've got all these monkeys on your back that ever after all the shareholders and regulators and all, all these people that drive you crazy. Um, and, and it changes the culture of a company because you can't be honest, you can't be honest with the people who work for you about everything that's going on in the way that you once were because what you tell them might be market, market sensitive and if you don't tell everyone then it, so it's a it's a pain in the ass it really is and I I, I, I would I will ne I've, I've got one left and I will never ever never ever work for or be a part of a public company again so that this um, if you can avoid it do um, anyway we went public uh, at some, you know, we were pretty lucky again. That was like July 2000. It was a sort of dot, just almost the end of the dot com boom. The um, the market kind of crashed about three months late, later, so like our share price halved. Uh, and then there was like there was a there was a long long journey back. Um, but you know, the mobile phone market kept on growing. We 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 had you know we've had some some real ups and downs. Um, over the years, I remember the you know some, some really bad days. There was we always had a we always had an interesting relationship with the mobile phone networks because on the one hand they liked the business that we brought, but in the end they did, they didn't like the transparency and the competition that we brought within the marketplace, and that we you know we, we did help to drive prices down because we allowed customers to compare and see see what the difference was. So. From time to time, there were sort of concerted efforts to try and reduce the power uh, that we had within the marketplace. And um, at one stage, both owners said, OK, we're not going to sell through car commerce anymore. They delisted us. That was a very destabilizing moment because that all the other guys could have said, oh, OK, we're going to, that's a good opportunity to kill them. Luckily, I worked out they hated each other more than they hated us. So they, they used that opportunity to, to take more business from Vodafone, and then um, and then I did some, some through some bizarre luck and some meetings and stuff. We managed to be the first people to stop the iPhone 
in the UK, and then that completely that switched the tables again between us and Vodafone. And Vodafone, had, Vodafone had to, to come back like that. I had, I've had moments where you sit there thinking, is is this entire house of cards about to about to um, collapse on us? And it takes resilience, um, some blind faith, um, and nerve just to just to get through those times and whatever business, whatever, I imagine whatever business you set up, whatever you do, you're going to have those moments and, you know, what they say, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, but, um, you know, you have those times. We, we had a, what else did we do during the time? We started Talk Talk in Carpen Warehouse and then we delisted that. That's been a, that's been a business that, itself has had its um, had its ups and downs. When we launched it in 2006, we, we massively repriced broadband, and we, we, we cut the price by about 40 percent. And needless to say, so many people signed up to it. It's like so many more people than we ever planned for, and, and so many more people that we could possibly cope with. So they all signed up. And we couldn't really provision all of them, but they started bringing us, we couldn't answer the phones, and they started going in the stores, and the people in the stores couldn't get to, through to anyone to find out what's going on, and it was, absolute, it was an absolute nightmare. And I'd send it, like, there's a great credit to the whole organization that never leave. I had to send this email, send this email on Sunday night to the whole company. And it, the, the subject line was the, the idiot who thought of free broadband. And I just said, I'm really, really sorry. I think I've created my own Iraq war. I, I didn't know what I was getting into, and I've got no idea how we're gonna get out of this. Um, but we're all just gonna have to, we're all just gonna have to lean in and fight and deal with it. And, um, and we did, and in a way, you know, it was very tough. To, I think in a funny way, but maybe it made the company um, stronger. So I think you, you might get a picture that sort of my I, I've got I'm, I'm quite an optimist and I find it hard not to do new things and things that I see and I've been sort of lucky enough to have people I've worked with an, an organisation that's managed to to pick up the mess as as we go along of, of the debris that that happens of, um, when you do those things and there's a I mean I think there's an important Point and I, you, you've got to be you've got to be prepared to fail. And if you're not failing at what you try to do, and you're not doing things that don't work, then you really are not trying hard enough. And if you get there are so many people, and as organisations get bigger, there are so many people who are obsessed with risk. But everything about being an entrepreneur, and everything about being a business, is about taking risk. That's that's how you make money. That's how that's how you get rewarded. You take a you take a calculated risk. If you take a risk, someone else won't take. Um, so I do think also you've got to have the you've got to have the stomach for that, and you've got to be sort of determined and resilient in the way that you that, that you deal with those, these things, but also optimistic. So you know whenever you go out and visit, whenever I go out and visit stores and come back and do think. We, we're, this organisation is so stupid. We're so hopeless. I, I don't have anything worse. Anything gets done. But you just progressively. It's just it's retail. Retail, I think, in particular, that many business, B2C businesses. There's never a silver bullet. It's just it's doing a million things a bit better and doing them right and just constantly, constantly. Very tiring, but you've got to keep doing that. And 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 sort of hand in hand with that is the. The bigger an organisation, the dumber it is. So, the from my experience, the, the the perfect company has six people in it. Because if there were six of us running a business, we all know we all know what's going on without really having to talk to one another, one another about it. And as a business gets bigger, you spend more and more of your time telling other people in the business what you're doing, not even dealing with the outside world. And, and I go around our offices and there's hundreds of hundreds of people sat in lots of different meeting rooms, all having meetings between themselves. 
And there's, a, there's actually, there's a, I think there's a sort of formula that you can work out is that every person that you employ, you reduce the productivity of the entire organization by a, by a percentage. And the thing that absolutely that, that, that chills my heart is whenever I meet someone and they're saying how well they're doing, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. We've got 200 people now. And I'm, that's not fantastic at all. That's a disaster. <laughs> if you can do it with 80, do it with 80. Have the number of people you employ is no measure of success. And it will just be harder and harder to, 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 to manage what you have to do. So, uh, so I, 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 I stepped down from the work. Well, sorry, we then, uh, what did I do? We then merged Carpo with Dixon's. So that's all now Curry's PC World, Carpo. And I stepped down from the board of that. Uh, I was the chairman of that in April. So now the only public company I've, I've got um, is Talk Talk, and then I have a, with, with a few other people, we have a, a private office and we make investments in, in mainly, mainly startup um, businesses, the, the most famous of which is, um, is Five Guys. So, uh, and we brought that over from the, from the US in partnership with the, with the, with the family from the US. Um, who invented it. But that's a really, really interesting business because it, it's a, I think it's, although they didn't understand it when they, when they did it, it's such a business of the modern time because they have two rules, no advertising and no PR. So you never ever spend a single penny Advertising. We have a PR agency whose job is to make sure we get no PR. <laughs> they they want the product to be so authentic and so good that the only reason anyone ever goes there is because they heard about it from someone they know. So they they had this idea of creating this this word of mouth network, and that you invest everything in the product and you make the product amazing, and that's how it's going to grow. Now, 25 years ago when they started that, that's a really brave thing to do because when you text messages, then there was, there was nothing. But now, with the way social media works, it's the most powerful thing. And, and, and if the, the product is, you know, the, it's better than the product is amazing, they're obsessive about making sure that they have the very best possible ingredients, cook perfectly, you know, they're so obsessive about it, they burn their, they burn their kitchen down at home perfecting cooking the fries. So, you know, they, they are obsessed about it. But then you do that and then you just shut up and you leave it to the rest of the world to talk about what you've done. And it works, it's, it, it's absolutely incredible. And the, really the only marketing we can do is the quality of the site. So we, we always pretend to have very high profile stores, sites that we open. People in the restaurant business are all screaming because they think we've, you know, we're paying too much money and we're having these sites that are, that are, that are um, too high profile. But so far, if I if I if I if I ranked the restaurants by the by the amount of the rent, if you, if you started with the highest rent and you then tried to rank them by the highest profit, it would be the same. We we can't pay too much rent. The better the site. So we just opened the site. We opened the site last November on Champs Elysees, um, which is I mean it's massive. No one's ever seen it. It's twelve thousand square foot. Uh, five guys on, on on three floors, three kitchens. It's absolutely vast. But if you go past an evening, there's still they're still queuing out the door onto the onto the Champs Elysees to get in. And again, we went to France. Not a single advert. Not a single piece of PR, we put, we, one advert, advert we did was a tiny thing about when we were recruiting people to work there, and that became this huge thing that went off on, uh, on Facebook and stuff about five guys is coming to, coming to France. So I'm just, I'm just so fascinated and intrigued with this because the world is changing so fast about how you communicate and how you embrace customers, and I think advertising is dead. I, I, I don't want. I, I keep saying to everyone in our, in our business that we will stop. We will just stop advertising. Put the money in the product. And let people talk about it. It's so easy for people um, to talk about it now. 
So that's really intriguing. We do other stuff in the private office of property on the online estate agent, but um, a variety of things. But I, in the end, the, the most exciting thing is to keep finding new things and the excitement of things that are growing and building a team and working together with people who are succeeding and changing things. That, that's the motivation, that's the point of being an entrepreneur, really. And that, and that ultimately is what's the most rewarding thing you can, you can possibly do. Okay. Uh, one question which probably everybody wants to ask. Nowadays everything is changing, but how do you still make money and uh, how to become rich and what do people need to do <laughs> to get there where you are right now? <laughs> I think if you're saying, everything I've always done is, is to sell, I've never really done business to business, I'm a business to consumer person. And one of the things I always found strange in Carphone Warehouse is, is like how dumb people would be about how, a, how to make a shop work. It's not hard, we all go shopping. We, we can all go in and we, we all know W. A. Smith is a shit shop. You can tell that. You, I can tell. You could all say it's a terrible shop. W. A. Smith. You queue for ages. It's a bad range. The roof's leaking. The carpet's dirty. What? You, we all know that experience, and we all know go to Presse Manche. It's probably the best retailer that there is in the world. We can see that. So, what, when when you're working in Carlton Warehouse, why can't you see that? So. I would say if you work in B2C, never forget that we're all C's and we all have that experience and we all see what's good and what's bad and we get furious with Ryanair or British Airways or furious with these people. We know, how to, we know what it feels like, just use common sense um, to fix it. And so also in your life, think about well, what are the things that are frustrating, what are the obstacles, what, what are the things that I could change for customers that would make their lives Simpler, cheaper, or better, and if you can, and if you can think of those things, then there's then there's an opportunity. So you think, you know, even if you take five guys, if you, you know, quite some time, you either went to McDonald's or Burger King, or you went to a, a restaurant that sold you a burger that you couldn't buy. There wasn't somewhere that was just had a better burger. And then Byron sort of saw what was happening in the U.S., and then GBK saw what was happening in the U.S. But in the in the end, it was. It was, it was time to bring the, the, you know, the product that actually was the better burger, that's what they created in the US, and, and do the real thing. And, but it works, because I think it, it is genuinely a better product. So you, you, that's, what you, that's, what you've got to, that's what you've got to do. And the minute that you stop being excited and obsessed about the product, we, we, talk, we talk in our business about people that just keep trying to squeeze more juice out of the lemon. You know, and you can you can you can squeeze a lemon and you can get some juice out, but in the end, it just gets harder and harder to get any more juice out of it, and you and, and you, you and the analogy kind of runs out. You need another lemon, and I think so many businesses just try and squeeze too much juice out of the lemon, and then they they ruin the experience or they ruin the way it is, they ruin the product. And so, I think that the trick is just to be enthusiastic and. I love to just stand there and see the cues and see the excitement. We just opened a new restaurant, uh, a new chicken thing in uh, it's at the top of Baker Street called Chicken. And this is breaded chicken. This is doing to can, this is doing to chicken what five guys did to McDonald's. So this does to KFC. So it's breaded chicken in a bun, and it's you know tenders, fries, all the stuff you get to KFC, but it's organic chicken, really nicely cooked, except it's not. And Again, to see that and see the ex and see the excitement there is around that, and see the customers and see the team and see their pride and see the products, that's really really motivating. I I, I feel pretty. I, I think it's going to work because I think people love chicken and chicken's pretty rubbish uh, at the moment. Your choice in Nando's is amazing, but breaded fried chicken is, is is pretty poor. So I think there's a really good opportunity. But again, I don't have to do it. I just but I, I love it. Final question before uh, we give uh, the opportunity to the crowd to ask a question. Uh, imagine you are 24 years old again, and uh, you are about to start some new venture. Which industry you would choose 
uh, what do you think would be your options and what kind of plans would you choose? I, I think it's about disruption. I, I think that is the opportunity. Is what can you what can, what can you disrupt that happens that, that happens right now in, in some kind of you know it's it's a it's quite a tough market, but we have a, we've got some guys who've got a business doing online estate agent. The estate agents are it's the kind of oldest fashioned cartel. It feels like there is because I, I you know I'm old enough that when I bought my first flat, you had to go to every estate agent in the area, register your details, and then and then they would put them in the post. And if it was if it was with with Foxtons, you had to go and see Foxtons. If it was this gun, and then with then with the uh, right and Zupa, the whole thing completely completely changed. So half of their job disappeared because they don't market the properties anymore. They just value them and show people around. But they still charge 1.8%. And so it's in that, you know, it's a put that the average person you pay spends seven thousand pounds to sell the house in, 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 in fees to an estate agent. So then people started saying, well, you don't need to do that, we'll charge you a fixed fee. So the fixed fee is like 10%. So you can sell you sell your house for seven hundred quid. That's a really, that's, that's a, it's hard to get going. It's a very big transaction. You're getting people to change the habit of a lifetime, but that's an incredibly disruptive thing to do if you can, if you can make it work. So the housing market isn't going to grow, but if customers are all going to start transacting online, then you're going to be in a growing market and then you've just got to fight for your share. You, you've got a chance. But you have a, you've got to have a reason as to why they should come to you. You just can't do, you just can't do the same as everyone else. It's, it's got to be different, it has to have an engine. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for the talk. I hope we'll have 20 more real estate agents after this talk. Uh, and now uh, it's open for um, uh, questions and uh, we'll just be like first, first uh, hand and then I'll so Charles, thanks for coming and how's for organizing it. Just a classic question. Uh, uh, well, it's two part. Uh, you've heard it happen times before. What are the common mistakes you see entrepreneurs making and what can they do to avoid or improve on that? Um, I, so I think that the, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's more of a risk now than it was when I started, which is, I think this is going to sound weird when I say it. I think it's too easy to raise money. So, and I say that because when we started, it was really hard to raise money. So as a result, we didn't raise very much and we just drove our working capital crazy and basically used our suppliers funding. That meant that by the time we got the business to scale, we owned a lot more of it. And at the moment, I, I see people too easily just say, I'm going to go for the next rate, I'm going to go for the next round. But you go for the next round, that's great, but the person just put the money on, they may have got a free ride on your effort, and you're going to build this amazing thing, and you're going to get to the turn, you're going to go, oh, I own 8% of it. That's great. And I've done all the work, and, and, and these guys in the background have made a fortune. You've got to be really, people, you've got to be really, really mean with your equity. That is so hard won and so earned. And it's so easy when you've got nothing to think, I've got nothing, I'm giving away nothing. But you believe it's gonna be worth something one day, don't give it away and be really mean about it. And I, I think there's gonna be a load of people who we all think have been done really well and are really successful, and the, you know, the day will come when they're gonna sell it or float it or do whatever they're gonna do, and they're gonna go, oh, that. Oh, that's it. I thought I was this genius, and, and, and all these other guys have made all the money out of it. So I think that's the biggest mistake people are making um, at the moment. And the, 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 the corollary to that is, if you've got too much money, you build your costs up too fast, which means the day that you get to be cash flow positive extends out. Uh, so that means you've got to raise more money. That means you get in a you get in a vicious circle. I remember David Ross, who, who worked with me, we were so, well, I was quite mean, he was so mean. The first day in our office, we were going like a year, and he found a packet of post-it notes, and he's like, that's it, this company's ruined now. Look at this ridiculous expenditure on stuff like that. And 
but you've got to have, you've got to have, if you have a really good mentality of just bootstrapping it and making do and borrowing and using second hand, whatever you, whatever you can do, you, you know, that, that in the end, that will pay and you'll get to make profit quicker. Will that answer the question? <coughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Good evening, Sir Charles. Um, thank you for a very honest and candid uh, talk. It's really pleasant to pleasantly surprised about how uh, matter of fact uh, you are about the car phone warehouse experience. Uh, uh, and the music to my ears about a disruptive product, because uh, I'm currently working on a disruptive product in the conveyancing sector. Okay. What I'm injecting is customer delight into that after 15 years of working in property law. But prior to that, I worked three years in car phone warehouse. Okay, very good. And I, and I learned more about customer delight in three years in car phone warehouse and 15 years in property law. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you sort of skipped over you know, the fundamental rules and the, and the culture and the, the ethics we had at Carlton, especially before PLC. Yeah. I was wondering if you could share you know, that, that, that ethos, that ethics, which separated us from phones for you and yeah. drove that success in the early days. I think that the, thank you for that. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, I think the other thing that's quite, is, is very energizing for businesses to have, have someone else to hate. And so, you know, and, and it's sort of completely ironic that we ended up merging with them because you remember in Carpenter West, we hated Dixon. And we hated everything about them, about their white socks and their extended warranty and their pushy, their pushy stuff and their sales that weren't really sales and all of the, all of the things that the, and, and they were so horrible to their suppliers. So in a way we just tried to be everything that, that they were. But we did have a, a, yeah, we had a real ethos and that's quite the good thing about being small and coming from nothing is to accept we are nothing. The only way you, you've never heard of us, we're tiny. The only way that the only way you should give us a chance, because we promise we're going to try much harder than the big established uh, complacent people will. So we did. We tried to do things that would really would, would shock and delight customers, and we tried to do things that were like saying earlier, which is, if you were buying something, how would you how would you want the experience uh, to be? And there's a, I wrote this thing, um, someone wrote this thing saying that customers can never love you more than you love them. And so you, 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 you the love you give, you get, you get reciprocated. Um, and if you don't love them, then obviously it's not going to be reciprocated. Um, you mentioned a lot of the time about failure and all the mistakes you might make. Um, what would you say your biggest mistake would have been during your career? Um, it's a weird one because it's got this free broadband, but if we hadn't, if we hadn't have had the, created the chaos, we'd never created the business. So, I, I mean, I've sort of been two minds as to whether it should have ever happened or not. Um, because that was the point where you could. We, you know, we just used to chance it and do things and see if they worked and if they didn't work, you'd get to fix it or stop it or change it. But so that we, we didn't realize the power that we had that we actually started something you couldn't stop and was now was an a, absolute and utter complete nightmare. Um, I don't know about it. A lot of time I've wished I never did it. It worked out. It did, but that's not. It's not. A, that's not a good. It's not. It's not a good parable. I don't think. <laughs> um, it, 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 I, I think it was like fifty point one percent that it succeeded. It was very, very. It was very close to, to killing us all. Hi, Sir Charles. My name is from Sabika Mobile. I just wanted to ask you one question. You never mentioned about best the deal with Best Buy. Yeah. Would you say that's the best deal you've ever done? Yeah, yeah, I think two things. I think getting the iPhone was that that, that completely transformed, re re-established our power in the marketplace. And yes, we then we then went to help a big American company called Best Buy sell mobile phones in their stores in the US. They're like the Currys of, of, of America. They have a thousand big stores, and they weren't very good at selling mobiles. And we did a, we did a, a deal with them to. Uh, car from warehouse stores. They, they were called Best Buy Mobile, but effectively car from warehouse stores in, uh, 
in Best Buy, and it was yeah, it was it was an unbelievable deal in the way that we set the deal up. The the success we had was enormous, so we built it into a really really big business. And then in the end, it just drove them mad. They had to buy it back from us, and that was a that was a that, that was quite all in all that was quite a sweet transaction. Can you hear me? I'd like to personally thank you for uh, bringing Five Guys over because the, the Burger King burgers got much smaller when they came over to the UK. It was very disappointing when I got here. Let's see, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously, I've seen that you've worked with American companies quite a lot. Um, are there any other countries that you're really interested in expanding to with any of your companies or working with at all? So I mean, we've so we've always had. I've always been involved in businesses in, in outside the UK and Europe, but never, never beyond that. And again, if, if I go to Best Buy or Five Guys or some, someone, I could say I, I could help you in the UK or France or somewhere. I, I can't help you. I don't know. I don't know any more about Japan or Qatar or somewhere than 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 they would. So I think you have to be realistic and humble about actually the value that you bring. You know, I've, I've had stores in France and Germany, so I've been driven mad there before, I know what it's like. So I can, you know, we do bring expertise um, to that. And so again, about having a, like an authentic partnership is you have to, you genuinely have to be bringing something to it. You can't just, you can't just bust that. And I think they will see through you really, really quickly. Well, what's your advice uh, for people who are just at university? <laughs> um, that's a pretty wide question. Um, it's funny, I went to, I, I to, to a talk at, at like Cambridge University's got an, uh, a business school, and they're, they're like, this guy goes, he's got his spreadsheet, and he says, at what percentage of certainty of success I'm, like, I'm trying to work out whether it's 68 or 71 percent that I should push the button and start this business. I'm like, you should just stop right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to work. You've got to be seeing your pants. You got to. I think what I said earlier is like, you've got to be prepared to lose, to lose everything. And I think that the risk if you go to university, come out with a really good degree, get on a graduate training program, and start doing well, the sacrifice you make to give all that up to start a business becomes greater and greater. So if you haven't, I, I mean, if you, if you know what you want to do, get going. Get on with it, because the longer you leave it, the harder it will be. Um, sorry, I've got, I've got two questions. Oh. The, the first one, you obviously had a background in sales. <clears throat> so you knew what one level of tech with businesses, your customers, and because you were, you, you, were, you were selling a product for somebody else. So you knew when you were selling for yourself what to do. What would be your advice for somebody who has a product but no experience in sales. Today, um, I completely agree with the fact that marketing sales, I, I, I think sales has been challenged quite a bit today as well. Uh, my second question is, um, as you were starting off, you had uh, a sales revenue, a pipeline, um, how did you stay focused and truly believe that mobile was a thing? I mean, surely at that point, you could have seen internet, websites, and so technology and other things popping up. How do you stay focused and, and not do what you're doing today, which is interesting other um, I think in the first question is you gotta remember basically everyone's in sales in the world. A, 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 a priest is in sales, he's trying to preach you religion and teachers in sales, they're trying to sell you learning stuff. I, I, you know, unless you're like a traffic warden or someone, you basically <laughs> The world's in sales, and, and you selling is about just making it, trying to make a connection with someone, but having the sensitivity to understand what it is that they want out of what you've got, and finding a way to to explain to them that it's going to do what they want. It, it's I don't think it's no more it's, it's no more than that. And, and I have been on sales courses and stuff, and all of the very old-fashioned, you know, closing techniques, and all of the I don't know, you know. They used to teach all these things so that you'd have to say, 
They want, so you always have to ask a, answer a question with a question. So you say, I don't know, does it come in red? How important is red to you? You never say no. And all this, I don't think that works uh, anymore. And I think you just got to connect with people and, uh, and, and empathize um, with it. In terms of your second question, um, I don't know, we just got on. We just got on this. We got on this roller coaster, and it just and it, it just started going. And, and, and to be frank, we didn't have time to think about anything. Yeah, how long did it take? Because you're putting out such a massive pipeline, and you didn't bother with it. Well, but, but by then you're just trying to live because you're, you're, you're selling, you've got people to pay, rent to pay. So it, it, the thing becomes immediately, you're not thinking about the macro world, you're thinking about how am I going to pay the back return on Thursday? Am I going to pay everyone, going to pay everyone on Friday? I'm waiting to get this money from this person. We didn't sell enough last week. It, it, it becomes, you, you become very, very quickly into the into the into the weeds of it, uh, and then that's that preoccupies you. Totally, you're just trying to survive with what you've got. That that was certainly my my experience. You know, I was 25, so I don't, I don't really know what I was what I was doing. I was learning. I was learning every single day as I went on. Hi there. Uh, two two questions following that theme again for you. The first is you were very modest about. Like the iPhone deal, like you just tripped over it, but I clearly know that's not the case. So I'd really like to, to know how you made sure you got that deal for yourselves, because you said it was defining for you. And secondly, this is a great story that I've heard before from you, so I'd like you to just to tell, tell the crowd here this evening, to talk a little, I, mean, I think it talks to the culture that you encouraged in your organization, and it's about the Christmas package that you sent around. Okay, so, yeah, okay. two questions, thank you. Um, but as, so the, the iPhone is like everything in life, it's, uh, it's random. So one of, one of the directors, of, one of the non-executive directors of Carlton Warehouse was also the chairman of EMI um, at the time. And Apple were about to get prosecuted in France because you could only buy, you could only play music you bought on iTunes on an iPod and they said that that was a restricted practice. So EMI then, then let Apple have some, some tracks with no DRM on them, so they could then argue to the French authorities that it, that it wasn't restricted. And at the same time, EMI had the Beatles back catalog and they let the, and they got the Beatles onto iTunes. And I think Steve Jobs probably was the fifth people he loved, just loved the Beatles. So that was really cool. So John said when they were doing it, right, the only, the, the condition we've done all this is we want a meeting with Steve Jobs. So he and I went on a plane and flew to Cupertino and we were meant to have a 15, about a 45 minute meeting with him and it went on like an hour and 45 minutes to be asking and asking and asking about the market and how it worked. And he didn't say anything in the meeting there and then, but subsequently we obviously explained, the, explained our role and all of the networks and the way that, it, way that we work. So that in the end he said, I want, somehow I got to, with Apple, I want you to launch with those guys, and it was the only, it was us and O2, it was the only country in the world where it wasn't just a carrier that they lost. So that's just, that's just luck. Um, and, you know, um, amazing, just amazing experience. But, and it's actually also, I guess the lesson from it is just, is, is kiss every frog. Whatever the opportunity, just chase it. You could have thought, getting on the plane, flying all those San Francisco, any meeting with guy might not even turn up, and it, it, it might have just so likely would have been that I would have given it a two percent chance of success. But you've got to chase, you've got to chase that because it's so important. Um, maybe I'll just, yeah, finish up with this this story. It's 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 us at our best and our worst. So in Carlton Warehouse, in the run up to Christmas, it used to get. I mean, it still does, but it used to get absolutely crazy. It's, Stores would be packed and everyone would be working flat out. They wouldn't get any lunch, they wouldn't get breaks, they wouldn't get out because of just dealing, dealing customers. So amongst the other things we used to do is we used to send them all a box. And inside it's called the Christmas Survival Pack. And inside it would be hot noodles, crisps, glucosade, and deodorant, and Christ knows what in this box. And it just would arrive at the store and it would just come with a note saying, we know the next two weeks is going to be absolutely frantic. This is just helping you guys get through it. And people really appreciated it because it, it was a sense that 
yes, it was going to be really hard, but at least it was appreciated and everyone knew it was going to be really hard. And then around the same time, I can't remember what year it was, this would be like late 2000s, I guess. Um, John Caldwell, who ran Phones to You, who, you know, they were our, the people we used, to, we used to battle with a lot. He was so mean that he, he, he used to change the commission scheme of the stores in November so they didn't earn too much money at Christmas because he had a very aggressive commission scheme. That was good. And it used to really piss him off, but he, he just, you know, he normally just kind of managed to keep it. But this one year, he went too far. He really cut it, and they were all absolutely furious. And they were talking about going on strike, and they were coming into our stores, cursing the thing. So we, we were in my office on a, on a Monday morning, and we were sat there, and we said to us, well, what can we do to make this worse? Um, <laughs> and so we came up with this evil idea, which is we sent one of the a Christmas, Christmas survival pack to every phone to you store as well, with a lovely letter that said, dear phone to you people, it's a seasonal tradition at Carphone Warehouse that we send this box because we know it's going to be crazy for you as well as us the next 40 days. You're not going to get a break. You're not going to get a This is just, just helps everyone get, get through it. And um, it occurs to us that this is, this is probably not the sort of thing that your management team would do. So with Christmas good wishes, please have this from everyone at Carphone Warehouse. And uh, John Corbett absolutely deserved he had already banned the email in the stores because he thought they were all sending emails, not sending phones, wasting time. So he had no way to communicate to the stores. So he started sending these faxes to them. And he sent this thing, and somebody brought us a copy of it, and it just said, all these boxes must be returned directly to the warehouse, unopened. And then the secretary brought it to him to sign. He signed it, and it had written in his own handwriting underneath. Anyone caught eating any car phone warehouse chocolate will be fired. <laughs> and like, John yeah. Yeah. Well, I Excellent. Four questions. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, asking, comparing you and John, what's, what, and the, uh, the other guy, what's, what sort of skill sets does he have that you don't have? Uh, 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 John's tough, resilient, you know, he's a lot, like, he's like, Old fashioned, you know, tough businessman. I've always been a bit more. Um, if you do the right thing, if you do the right thing, people will do the right thing back. I think you know, John was always tougher on everyone. Ruthless. Sorry, ruthless. Was he ruthless? I, I didn't work. I didn't. I didn't work with him. But he was a tough guy. Hard, you know, old fashioned, tough sales guy. And I, mean, I was always more on the basis that. The better you treated people, the better they did. I, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I've, I've been let down at times. I'm sure he's been let down at times. You know, everyone has their own, has their own style. Uh, hi, Charles. Um, sorry, I have a fan here. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so hi. Hello. Um, also used to work in Parkland. So hi. Thank you. I did get a Christmas box, but um, uh, I've now left since or so you're done with it. We can talk about that later. <laughs> 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 So was I. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll set up the club. Um, I've set up my own business, um, but one of the things I wanted to ask, and you know, maybe you kind of alluded to this in your last question, um, relationships and partnerships is probably one of the things that either make or break a business or deal. I guess, can you get your advice on external things that you can't control in a partnership, what you can try and help and support that, both to the external things? And then what would you advise yourself Entering into partnerships, how you best self manage. Thank you. Um, I, 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 are you talking about, I guess, suppliers or customers? But uh, business partners. Well, well, any kind of relationships, suppliers, business partners, customers. I always, I think one of the great lessons I learned early on is that the people that were selling us stuff, it wasn't their money. It was my money. So I cared more than they did. And if you made their life easy, and you behaved nice, and you, you, the things that mattered to them, you did, in the end, you'd get what you wanted out of them. And the kind of, again, like old fashioned, very adversarial way of dealing with, with your suppliers, I don't think works. So I think you have to be a, you have to be a good partner, but obviously you have to 
you have to fight to protect yourself. You can't have people take advantage of you. Sure. Uh, quick question of people. When you're evaluating Um, well, you have to know that you can that you can work with them. So, um, you know, we've looked at other stuff and just concluded. I mean, either they concluded they couldn't work with us, or we concluded we couldn't work with them. Um, I mean, it's critical. I I think that the I, I think I learned also is that pretty much the impression you the impression you make of someone in the first sixty seconds. Is, is, is it? And I, I, I've, I've often thought, I'm, I'm not sure about that person. And then I, the longer I've talked to them, I've talked myself into hiring them. And then I've gone back to no, my bling. My bling was right. Um, and I think actually in, in, in life, you need to trust your instincts um, more, than we, more than perhaps we, we all feel, always feel comfortable with. <laughs> I'll, I'll be my friend. Uh, quick question for me. When car companies start giving meds, do you stop yourself from trying to pick boys? Was um, a question. We just, we, we were just fought harder, went faster. But we, we started, the, the, the idea that I said quite soon after we started it is that, and, and it was really the iPhone that, was the, that proved this point, which was, we need to build a business that no one can ever think of launching anything in this marketplace and not having it sold in car from one house. Because if you get to that position, then you then you are very powerful. You control access to the market. Um, and we just went fast, behaved well. There were a lot, you know, there were a lot of there were a lot of spits and dodgy people in the in the mobile phone business in the early days. So we were. You know, we were more honest and better to deal with than many, many other people. We just met. We did. We did what we said, and we we, we did it well, and we were honest, and we were good partners. It's a final question. Uh, as a founder of a company that is raising funds now, I'd like to understand your psychology as an investor. When you're looking at companies and you're evaluating what to invest in, except for the potential to disrupt the market, like you just said. What are the some of the criteria that for you personally are the most important ones? Well, uh, we, we tend to not and I, anymore. I don't actually. I don't just. I just. I don't do small investment. I either get to a point where we kind of have effective control or significant over thirty percent significant influence, and then it's just it's about the idea and the and the people. I just had too many experiences where you end up with fifteen or twenty percent and. You end up and giving the people tons of support. They don't necessarily do what you think they should do, and it becomes. You need to, I think, be an investment professional to do that, which I'm not. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a manager. Um, if you like, so it's, it's the idea and the people. That's the, and that's you've got to, You can't have, can't have one without the other. Really. Cool. Thank you very much, Sir Charles Lanson. Let's give a big hand. <laughs> have some drinks and network a bit and uh, thank you for coming as uh, mentioned we are in